Peter and I in particular used to play together. We used to play old soul numbers in the main, Otis Redding stuff, uh, Wilson Pickett, things like Benny King. And uh, I don't know, he, I always thought Pete had a great voice for that kind of material. I mean, he always wanted to play the piano as well, actually, you know, but I managed to get there first, so I did that. And Jonathan King was an old boy at the school, and one day on the old boy's day, he, he tended to like to turn up, so we, we just thrust a tape on him. We got more and more involved in doing sort of slightly what you might call more typical later Genesis stuff. Um, but he wasn't really into that, and we realised we were losing him. So Peter and I very specifically sat down one day and wrote a song tailor-made to Jonathan King's tastes, and uh, his favourite group at the time were the Bee Gees, so we wrote a sort of Bee Gees pastiche song, you know, which was called The Silent Sun, and, uh, and he loved it. We needed a name for The Silent Sun, we wanted to put it out as a single. No one had a, had a good idea. Between ourselves, we couldn't agree. One comes to, to, come to mind, which in fact was one of Ant's ideas, which I think tells us a little about the era, which was the Champagne Meadow, I remember that. So I'm very glad that that wasn't it. By the time we came round to doing Trespass, uh, the second album, we'd done a certain amount of live playing, and we'd, you know, we'd written loads and loads of material, and the whole idea of the band had completely transformed from being a band that was trying to have a hit single to a band that was trying to do something adventurous musically. I did suggest at the time that we looked for a new drummer, because I thought it was important that we ought to um, try and get a drummer who was kind of of equal stature. And I must admit, I'm not flattered, but no, I mean, there was, you know, I think little doubt at the end of that session that, that Phil was the best. I mean, certainly Peter and I felt that. And, um... <laughs> the, rest, the, rest was so <laughs> the rest was so terrible. Split decision. I mean, there was a, some encouragement in the early days. There was a few people who liked us, you know, as I say. And, um, I think, really, what we were able to bypass a little bit, the fact that we weren't critically very well received by the fact that, um... I think Peter and his costumes and stuff started to get us a bit of attention, you know. I mean, I, when you first put on these sort of uh, the dresses and foxes' heads and everything, and we suddenly started getting a picture in the paper, you know. In order to get the kind of variety of sound we were looking for, it used to take us a very long time to set up between songs. And so we used to, when we first went on stage, we had these sort of embarrassed silences. So we'd start to tell stories, you know, which sometimes are totally irrelevant to the song. And we had these sort of um, slides behind us. We had three, you know, a triple screen system of slides, which are about a thousand slides, and they changed throughout the show. We did about 100 shows of, of Lamb Lies Down, and I'd say it probably only all worked. Well, it never all worked, actually. It came close to all working on about four or five occasions, and they were great. Unfortunately, every other night there was always something wrong. It was an opportunity he felt he couldn't turn down. And at the time, it just wasn't wrong for us to, to, to allow people to do things like that, you know. It just would have been totally wrong. Uh, I felt that quite strongly. You know, he grew up perhaps quicker than the rest of us, really, in a sense, in that, at that time, and he wanted a bit more time than we, could, we felt we could give. The rest of us were totally committed to it, and so he, he felt he had to leave, you know. I had long talks with him about it, because obviously we, were, we came into the group as sort of like best friends and everything, and, uh, and him leaving was a, was, a, was a big blow to me personally. It seems so obvious now, doesn't it, you know, you had a singer in the group and everything already. But, you know, I mean, we got, Peter had all sorts of things that sort of came with him, and the, it was just like thinking of Phil, I don't know, I mean, I, I wasn't sh sure. Phil always had a lovely voice for sort of soft stuff, but he had no, no ability, no, at the time he'd never sung anything hard at all, you know, we had no idea how he'd cope with the hard song. Really. The, the first gig was strange because I'd been used, so used to just looking up and seeing Peter there and I got a certain confidence of seeing Peter. You had Peter to look down, didn't you? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I was looking down, you're right. And it just looked, seemed so funny. But and it also, you just didn't know really how the audience were going to react because you thought that they were going to miss him and everything. Uh, miss Peter, I mean. And uh, it was very strange, about halfway through the show, I suddenly realised this was going to work. I mean, he had his own approach to the audience, but they, they sort of seemed to like him, you know, sure. which was <laughs> curious, you know. <laughs> well, it's, it's you never... talk about it in third person, actually, just sitting here. <laughs> yeah, it's like, I, I remember that very, I mean, London, Ontario was the yeah. gig, and I, and I just remember being more worried about what I was going to say to the audience than anything else, because Peter, what did, Peter did have was a communication. And uh, although it was, a, as it was more of a mysterious traveller than a bloke next door or a mate, he did communicate with an audience, and I thought that was very important. So I was more concerned about that aspect of it working than actually singing the song. I think because, the, because Phil had come from within the group, I think people were very forgiving. And also, if I, I think musically, the band sounded better than ever. In America, it was rather difficult because we had a biggish shows. So we happened to play sort of fairly biggish places, but getting tiny audiences in them. And of course, that's a recipe for disaster. You're losing money left, right, and centre. Do you want to go on the bus, or are you going to go, you going to, go to the Mayfair and pick up the bus, or no. are you going to drive all the way out there? <laughs> I mean, yeah, the Mayfair's very nice. Yes, it may be, but uh, <laughs> drive a little bit quicker than your bus can. Drive all the way to London. To the traffic. It's, it's, it's very nice. So, Pretty. Get stuck. Never no, it was funny because he just didn't turn up one day um, when we were doing the mixing of um, Seconds Out, I suppose it was. Yes, the live album, you know. 
so he didn't turn up so we mixed him out of the rest of the album and that was it really no he, he just I don't know it's a, I wasn't really expecting it actually I was kind of surprised because on Wind and Wuthering I felt he did the, some of the best writing contribution he'd ever done for us then there were three. It was, it was a very pleasurable experience, which was the first album when we was a three-piece. We had one guy who sort of sang and drummed, and another guy who did all the guitars and basses, and another guy who did all the keyboard work, which even at that stage was starting to be quite an expansive role because it would sort of go into the world of drums and guitars and things quite a bit. And I think between us we felt very complete, you know, certainly from the point of view of a, of a studio band. Nacquero sul finire degli anni 60 per iniziativa di due aristocratici studenti inglesi. The Follow You, Follow Me was the first hit single we had and it, it sort of doubled the sale of the album. I think also being a romantic song, and we weren't known for romantic songs, um, we suddenly, we sort of, the main difference in our audience, it suddenly became, a, a lot more females came to see the group. I stopped reading it now, actually, I've stopped reading press because it, it's, it's, it's too depressing. If you wanted to get a good review of a Genesis album, it can't be that difficult. There are an awful lot of people out there who like us, so it must be possible to find them. Um. Enemy was interesting because it was so vicious, you know, and it wasn't just vicious to us, it was vicious to hundreds of people. Tony Banks has scored several films and collaborated with artists like Toya Wilcox and Fish of Marillion. In 1989, he released the solo album Banks Deep Night. Tony, I would say, is the, is the most important writer in Genesis. That's what him with Mike is a close second. The most important writers in Genesis in terms of what people like about Genesis. And yet Tony has the least success. But if people knew what he brought into Genesis, they'd probably give his solo work more of a listen. Last, the bank statement record, I, I was I was very satisfied with the record. I enjoyed that a lot, and uh, I, I'm I was actually it must be all honesty, very surprised it didn't do anything at all. I, I really thought it was going to do something because I thought it had two or three songs on it that would have got the attention. But um, and to be honest, I mean most people who are watching this, a lot of people I suppose who are watching this will who are like Genesis, you know, probably won't ever even heard of the album, let alone heard it. You know, and that's a shame really because it is it is very much part of the sort of you know, the Genesis kind of world, if you like, and it would be something I think a lot of people could like a lot. I mean, I sing the odd track on my solo stuff, and people find almost that those are the easiest tracks to take because at least they've got some personality to go with it, you know? Um, and yet my voice is, is doesn't compare with the other voices I've used. Well, But I think because we do the solo stuff, individual writing, written material is now well taken care of. And the feeling is that we must keep the group for something that only the group can do, which is writing material together. And we felt over the years, you know, even back in the days when we were writing, perhaps doing more individual stuff, that often the best songs were the ones that were written by the group in the studio. And so when we decided, when we came in with the album, Abacab in particular, we decided we'd start doing it that way. And uh, we actually wrote it in this room. <laughs> It's quite a frightening thing to do in a way, you know, but then I suppose you always know that if it didn't work, you could always, you know, get some material that we've written individually. I often feel something of a spectator to it, I suppose, because I'm not, I'm no performer, I'm really not a sort of, um, yeah, I'm sure people have seen me, they know that uh, I'm very static on stage and everything, you know, my, as I say, my contribution as a writer is not really as, as any, in any other role. Um, I do the rest of it well enough, and I've always been dependent on other people to be the sort of, um, the actual communicators to the audience. So I'm sometimes there and I, I'm able to just look at it all, you know, and uh, I, I, it's, it's, it's extraordinary. I mean, I, I'm amazed by it sometimes. You see all these people, and they're all sort of shouting. And, and uh, you know, and it's great. I mean, I love it. I just love people to get pleasure from the music, you know, because that's, that's what you want. I mean, everyone wants to be appreciated. You like to play a song, and, you know, and you want people to like it. And uh, a lot of people have them.